If you were to ask me which decade in gaming displayed the most progress and innovation ever, I'd have to say the 90s. Although I wasn't around for it, something that'll likely shock some of you, I look back and easily see all the technological achievements made, from the improved capabilities of 2D visuals, the birth of many now mainstream genres, and the advent of 3D games. But towards the end of the decade, Sega's final and arguably coolest console, the Dreamcast, was able to show us the potential refinements of 3D games. Although it didn't sell too well, it really had one hell of a library with classics like the Sonic Adventure titles, Shenmue, Grandia 2, Skies of Arcadia, and my favorite, Jet Set Radio. Games that appealed to a lot of gamers, not only for the diversity and quality, but also because of the aforementioned graphical power of the system used to display these games. There was nothing really like it at the time, and as such, it also attracted many developers to the system to make their own games. One of these companies attracted to the power of the Dreamcast was Atlas, specifically their research and development Team One. Not wanting to waste an opportunity, Atlas R&D One released their cult hit Machinax onto the Dreamcast. It's a game that, over time, I've come to love more and more for the gameplay and story it tells. It's a game which I'd like to see be given more attention and appreciation, hence why I'd like to give a great look back on Machinax in this series of retrospectives. It's no doubt that Machin X is a rather old game. Hell, it predates me by a few years, believe it or not, but before it came out, it was envisioned during the development of the PlayStation 1 classic Persona 2 Innocent Sin, around 1998 when the Dreamcast was about to be brought into the world. It wasn't all too lengthy of a development either, only taking about a year according to Cozy and Kaneko in a pre-release interview. What started out as a way to test the Dreamcast's capabilities and power, according to Cozy, eventually became a project him, Kaneko, and likely a lot of the other staff got into over the very small development period. After its short time in the oven, Machin X debuted on the Dreamcast for Japan in 1999 and 2000 in the West. It's a notable title for a multitude of reasons, such as its unique approach to 3D action and progression, as well as being a real comfort zone breaker for the staff of the game. If you look at a lot of the main staff's portfolio beforehand, they really hadn't done too much similar to Machin, with the biggest factors of note being once again the 3D action gameplay and its fully voiced cutscenes. But it wasn't all New Horizons for Machin X, as a lot of its DNA borrows heavily from the Shin Megami Tensei series, with its focus on mythology and approaches to endings. And is also upsettingly why a lot of people refer to this game as a Megami Tensei game nowadays, which it really isn't, but whatever. Weirdly though, while doing research for this part, I noticed that Machin isn't all too dissimilar to Catherine. They were both made as a way for the developers to get their feet wet with new technology using rather foreign gameplay styles. In Machin's case, 3D sword action in the first person. They also share some staff between them, the biggest note, at least for now, is the game's director, Ketsuro Hashino, in his first ever directorial role, believe it or not. Known very well nowadays for his work on the modern Persona trilogy, and at the moment, he currently has his eyes set on whatever the hell re-fantasy is, and I personally love his work, especially on Persona 4, go play that game, please. The other two staff of note are the aforementioned Kozi Okada and Kazuma Kaneko, two people who I've already talked about previously in the Persona 2 video. So I'll try to keep it brief, but relevant to Makin. Cozy is credited as, as producer, whereas Kaneko is lead artist. Going off of the interview, both Cozy and Kaneko contributed to a lot of the little things in Machin, including the game's story, and why the themes of law and chaos are still present in the game. Amongst the many other literary choices, next to the game's credited writer, Kazunari Saki. Of the staff, I believe that Machin X is the most overlooked in their entire portfolio in pretty much every aspect too. I had mentioned earlier I want to bring more attention to this game and what it does, so to start, I'd like to spend this part of the retrospective going over the writing and story of Machin X. Our story begins at the Kanzawa Research Institute located in Japan, with a research team conducting work on an undercover project titled Plan X, led by Chief Sagami. He's assisted by two scientists, JJ Jones and Ann Miller, all working together to give this artificial brain called Machin a mind. The two assistants try to decide on what Machin's name is before letting Machin himself decide, going with the name Makina, who I'll just be calling Machin for brevity's sake. A few seconds after Machin decides on its name, two new faces enter the research lab. Female high school student, daughter of the chief, and our main character slash heroine, Kei Sagami, and following her close is her good friend Ko. The two here to witness the progress on Plan X. We learn from Kei that the goal is to give this artificial brain a mind of its own, which is done by having an individual temporarily transfer its psi to Machin, letting it create its own psi and thus an identity of its own. But before any of that is capable of happening, the goal of today is to awaken Machin, a job given to Fei Chao Li, Kei's kendo tutor and a blade master, giving him the gene meant to awaken Machin, which he proceeds to do. Everything seems to be going on without a hitch, 
That is until an intruder enters the research lab, knocks out Ko, fatally wounds Fei Chao, kidnaps Chief Sagami, and attempts to escape. With his final words, Fei Chao Li tells K to follow the blood agreement and to take the sword to protect everyone. K grabs Machin and awakens it. This is where the first level takes place, where K slash Machin tears through the opposition, making their way to the intruder and swiftly beating him before he's able to escape. Though peace has been restored to the Research Institute, Chief Sagami remains kidnapped. Seeing as we can't do anything now, we return to the lab, where we learn from the research team that K's Sai is uniquely bonded to Machin. Both K and Machin's minds exist simultaneously within Machin's brain, although it is unknown if it'll be possible to separate K's Sai from Machin. That discussion gets quickly interrupted when the lead sponsor behind Plan X, Li Fu Shou, reveals that the true purpose of Machin slash Plan X is to prevent the end of the world and the incoming World War III, with the power of being able to absorb and destroy the Sai of others, furthering its strength, extracting information, and creating an identity of its own. Li Fu Shou also tells us to perform a technique on the invader, Hake Andre, called brainjacking to figure out where the chief was taken and use his body for combat. He then instructs us to travel from Japan to Hong Kong to meet with Fei Chao's sister, and then Moscow to meet with a blade master named Kitty. While on the flight to Hong Kong, we run into, let's just say, a bit of trouble. Sir, you have our thanks for flying the deadly skies and, by the way, prepare to die. How could you be so daft? Of course this is a trap! We're too high up, sweetheart. You're not going anywhere. But then make it to our destination in China, no problem. Alright, nice landing. You're a pretty good pilot. In Hong Kong, K runs to Fei Shan, the aforementioned sister of Fei Chao Li, who instructs Machin to take care of the Hake Shaja in India. Shaja is a famous movie star, using his influence to send radio waves through televisions to take people's sigh. Pretty obtuse plan, but it's doing a lot of damage, so we have to stop them. After agreeing to Fei Shan's request, we head to India, much to the chagrin of Kei, who just wants to save her father, and make our way through his palace. We encounter Shaja, learning that he follows a person named Geist, and is working to eradicate human emotion, creating a perfect world through his influence. He's on this path because of how his son betrayed him, and coming to the realization that humans are born with both an evil and good side. Hence his reason for working with Geist. We deal with him and head off to Moscow. There we meet Blade Master Kitty and retrieve Kay's father, who unfortunately had his side taken, making him nothing more than a sack of meat. Kitty then informs us about the aforementioned Big Bad Geist and his plans to eradicate the human race. She lets down the bombshell that at one point Geist was on the side of the Blade Masters and doing what he could to protect the Earth, but now Geist has gone rogue and uses the same powers as Machin to cause harm. Next, Kitty fills us in on who the Hakai are, people who follow Geist's plan and do what they can to help him achieve his goals. Drawn to him after having their size manipulated by a Geist during a vulnerable point in their lives. After that, we learn about the Blade Masters and who they are. Skilled fighters who put their lives on the line protecting mankind, and the ones who will give us our missions during the game. Lastly, Kitty instructs us that it's Machin's destiny to defeat Geist, stop the Hake, and bring peace back to the world, warning us not to betray them. From this point on, the mid-game occurs, and the goal is to save Kei's papa with the help of the Blade Masters, gain strength, and put an end to Geist and the Hake's destruction of the world. Before Moscow, however, the game takes us back to the Kanazawa Research Institute, where we learn about this religion encouraging people to off themselves as a way of achieving salvation, likely another one of Geist Hake. For now, I'd like to take a little diversion from the story and go more into the important characters, themes, and real-world influences of Machin's story. Starting with the characters of the previously mentioned Kei Sagami, she's our main character slash heroine and can probably explain who she is better than I can, so... I'm Kei Sagami. I'm 16 years old, and I attend Jusei High School. I have no siblings. My mother died right after I was born. You see, well, that's why my father was always around. So I wouldn't feel lonely. I really respect him. Aside from that, she's also just a generally kind and caring person, always trying to see the best in people, though she does have her feisty side, being more than willing to speak up when she doesn't agree with something and displaying some rather selfish tendencies at times. She's still a teen after all, so it ends up making sense. Despite those traits, she's still a really nice person as we see throughout the game. 
and as the game progresses, she develops and grows more as a character as she gets to interact with the many Hake, Blade Masters, and especially Makin, attempting to learn and understand why they follow the path they chose in life, often choosing to bounce ideas off of Makin. Speaking of which, let's get into Makin slash Makina. To once again re-establish, Makin is the result of the Plan X project, originally thought to have been a project meant to deal with mental illness. Its true intent and purpose is to defeat the equally powerful Geist. Makin is an artificial brain that develops its mind the more Sai it absorbs, as well as gaining more strength from Sai as well. Makin is also capable of doing other things with Sai, such as modifying and extracting the memories from it. Aside from absorbing Sai, Makin's identity is formed more as the game goes on depending on the choices the player makes throughout, mainly with the Blade Masters and K. Makin can be many things, and it's really up to you at the end of the day. Having our two most important characters out of the way, let's move into the themes and real-world influences of Makin X. The most significant theme and inspiration for the story Makin X wants to tell can be found in the concepts of the Chinese philosophy Taoism. Taoism is a very popular, influential, and especially broad philosophy that all operate under the belief such goal of harmonization with nature. There are various types of Taoist believers that each follow their Tao, which is a path to harmony, a concept we see throughout the game under Geist, the Hake, and the Blade Masters. The goal of Geist and the Hake is to create peace and harmony on Earth by lowering the human population and erasing the faults that come with being human through using very extreme measures. This is the Tao of Geist and the Hake. The Taoist beliefs of Geist and the Hake are very similar to a Confucian Moist belief, the belief that political power should be used to unite everyone under a single Tao, something that will be easier to see as the game continues. Although it doesn't necessarily fall under Taoism, the philosophies are combined in a way to create a personal but familiar philosophy that Geist and this Hake follow. As for the Tao of the Blade Masters, their means of achieving harmony is by maintaining order on Earth, done through the protection and dedication. They're pluralist, in the belief that the point of harmony is the tolerance of others' Tao, wanting to maintain the order of society and their individual Taos. But their fight against Geist and the Hake also paint the Blade Masters as being primitivist as they're against establishing a single Tao. Machin X also tends to use and refer to Taoist symbols, both in its imagery and writing. Two cases of this are the usage of the very influential yin and yang slash taijutsu and the bagua. Yin and yang essentially represent Taoism by symbolizing harmonization with nature, goals for the two aforementioned factions of Machin X. As for what yin and yang means in a general sense, it represents how two opposite forces end up having a lot more in common with one another and influence the other in a way. As an in-game example, the chaotic influences and the goals of the Hake and Machin X give rise and motivation to that of the Blade Masters and their duty to protect the world from them. Both groups have the intent of creating harmony on Earth but go about it in different ways, influencing the other to take action, as well as using similar means to achieve their desires as we'll see. Yin and Yang is also used in a lot of the game's imagery, from the logo of the Kanazawa Research Institute, your rank, the Sai you collect, and showing up when you brainjack another character. There are many more examples, but these are the most apparent to me. There's also another, very important in-game example of yin and yang in Machin X. however I would like to save that for later. As for the Bagua, which translates literally as 8 areas, in Taoism it represents the fundamental principles of reality. Each of the 8 areas represent one aspect of reality and are represented by 3 line symbols representing yin and yang, with the broken lines representing yin and the unbroken line being yang. To quote Bagua Center on the intent of Bagua, through understanding the Bagua, we can redirect the energy flow to focus on things we need to improve and enrich by increasing the positive chi and correcting the negative chi. With proper use, this tool will help an individual achieve his goals and will be a powerful and positive influence on his life. In Machin X, the symbols used in forming the Bagua are used on the many enemies you find in the game. For example, on the very common grunt of the game, it has the symbols representing both wind and fire on their mask fittingly accompanied by a dragon on their outfit. A less direct example of the Bagu and Makin is in each of the Hake. According to in-game sources, each of the Hake represent a part of the Bagu, an example of which we saw with Shaja. One part of the Bagu Shaja correlates to is Chen, which can symbolize family in the past. Two things that motivate Shaja's decision as he was betrayed by his own son. All the Hake can represent more than one part of the Bagua. It's just that some identify more with one over others. Lastly is the very interesting topic of sacrifices and modification, both physical and mental. When looking into the many characters of Machin X, both their history or design, the common occurrence between most characters is some sort of sacrifice. As we'll see through Machin X, every Blade Master had to make some sort of physical sacrifice, with someone such as Kitty removing her own womb. As for non-Blade Masters, Hake such as Shaja and Andre have made modifications to their bodies, such as Shaja's multiple arms and Andre's tongue scalpel. Even in the regular grunts in Machin X share this trait, with enemies like this guy who had their whole upper body made bulkier. There are so many enemies that share this trait that to go over all of them would be insane. 
The topic of sacrifice and modification is a topic I'd like to get more into later as it's very important to the story and will be discussed with hindsight. Ending off this section with the more fun part, to put it lightly, is how a lot of Makin's hake are actually based off of real world people, or at least real world figures. See, someone such as Hake Andre is based off of this Russian serial killer called Andre Chikatila. That, uh, who likewise was part of the Soviet army and diagnosed with some sort of borderline personality disorder. Makinex likely chooses to base a lot of the Hake off of reality for the sake of using their history as a way to explore Chinese philosophy and the many issues Makin confronts about our real world. Now, despite being a pretty backburner sort of project for the Atlas R&D1 team, they've more than shown that Makinex's writing was thought out in the end. We'll continue to see the fruits of their labor as we continue with the game story, which I feel is appropriate to get back into right about now. After taking care of things in Moscow with Kitty, we make our way forth to Europe, where we spend a large chunk of the game exploring and putting a stop to Geist and his Hake's actions. We start our way through Europe, going through the empty, decrepit streets of London, leading to the ruined streets of Amsterdam, where we meet our next Blade Master in a club. His name is Devin. He informs us of a group set from the Hake, wreaking havoc on Europe, instructing us to deal with them by taking care of their leader. Throughout the conversation, it's real that Devin is a pretty pessimistic person believing that humans are stupid and selfish by nature. His pessimism comes from being a Blade Master, seeing as they've never been able to make a great change like stop a war and have only been delaying the inevitable. Devin doesn't really enjoy being a Blade Master, only working as one because it's his destiny. In spite of everything about Devin, he's not a complete sad sack at one point having a lover and feels obligated to protect the world as a Blade Master. It's like he's concluded that no matter which sides do end up succeeding, the possibility for true harmony will never be reached. Devin does hold his doubt to some extent as a Blade Master, but his perception has most likely jaded him, and as such, barely holds on to his philosophy. He acknowledges that the world he lives in is worthless, yet there are still things he has worth in, such as his ex. Speaking of which, his ex is actually the leader of that group wreaking havoc on Europe, and he wants us to deal with her in Vienna. A request which we take him up on, letting us brainjack his body. We head to Vienna where we meet Devin's ex, and the Hake leading the group causing the chaos in Europe, Margaret. We reach her base and encounter her, learning about her beliefs in Tao. She believes that humanity can only peak with there being only superior humans. We don't learn all too much about her, but she still likely has feelings towards Devin. If I'm being honest, she's one of the more one-note Hake. Fits into the game's themes, but doesn't do much outside of that. She represents the soon on the Bagua, which often means hips, flexibility, wealth, and prosperity. The first two aspects are pretty noticeable, seeing as they're integral into her attacks and movement, using a lot of kicks, and she's acrobatic to say the least. The latter two, however, are hard to miss. For starters, she leads a group of Havoc Reekers, and second, looking into her character can reveal that Margaret was at one point married to the leader of the European Union, granting her a higher status than usual. Bring character aside, she puts up one hell of a fight, but we take care of her. And after that, we make our way to Lan, where we meet another Blade Master, Tyrus. We learn through him that a lot of the Blade Masters take other jobs while serving as Blade Masters. Tyrus, in particular, covers as a writer. He further reveals to us the struggle of being a Blade Master. They all have to give up their previous lives, leaving their families behind to protect the world. One such Blade Master was actually Kay's mother, who turns out might not actually be dead. It's through him it further shows to us this theme of sacrifice that this game pushes very much. Blade Masters have to make many sacrifices, leaving behind their previous lives and giving up their body parts, such as Devin's spine and in Tyrus's case, one of his feet. Tyrus definitely comes off as more optimistic than Devin due to his reasons for fighting Geist. He believes that soul slash psi is what allows humans to have emotions and actually be alive, and why he fights as a Blade Master. By being alive and having emotions, we're able to figure out the Tao in life, which best works for us. However, emotions and Psy can result in destruction as we saw from Hake Shaja, who holds opposite beliefs on emotion. Tyrus then informs us to deal with the Hake Don Regalia in Sicily, who has been doing a multitude of things to tarnish the world, such as dealing with drugs, polluting the earth, and causing cataclysmic food shortages. He demands us to put a stop to him by getting his location. We agree to his terms, learn of his location back in London, and head over to Sicily. We make our way there, where Don Regalia introduces himself. He believes that people who pursue power end up with some unforeseen consequences, and leads him to a conclusion all too similar to Shaja. He concludes that human emotion is what corrupts people, and follows Geist in hopes of eradicating those inherent traits. Unlike Shaja, he doesn't want to fully eradicate human emotion and only the corrupt aspects. He represents Dwe on the Bagua, which represents children, a low-key aspect of Don Regalia's character seeing as he's actually infertile. Also, Don Regalia uses his infertile parts as projectile weapons, tying back into that whole body modification theme. Despite his rather large frame and mean swing, we're able to take care of Don Regalia rather easily and then head off to Rome slash Roma. 
It's because of Don Regalia we're given access to a secret part of the Jean d'Arc Palace where we can encounter another Hake. There we meet Hake Rei, a familiar face with him being the one encouraging that shady religion we learned of earlier in the story. Rei is a follower of Geist in the belief that him, a god, is the only one capable of determining good and evil. Rei holds the sentiment that humans are incapable of determining what truly is good and evil, right and wrong. Citing the burning of Jean d'Arc as the moment he had realized this, he fills in the Lee part of the Bagu, which relates to fame and reputation, the color red, and his eyes, all aspects which Rei encompasses, seeing as Rei is actually considered to be the next in line for the role of Pope, and that he covers his eyes with his artificial hands most of the time, which are revealed to be all red. After his monologue, we take him on and finish him off, in one of the trickier battles in the game. We head out of Roma and into the nearby Athens, where we meet Elise, a blade master who was at one point a mother before giving that up to become a blade master. She holds the belief that the world is filled with corrupt morals and unhealthy ideologies. She's a rather receptive individual, knowing that only taking care of the external problem, citing the current Grey Plague going around Europe, won't be enough to heal humanity and achieve harmony. Only healing our soul and Sai can do that. In spite of that, she still has a mission to put a stop to the Hake doll that's causing this very plague in Europe. She asks us to find his daughter in Istanbul and learn of his location. We agree to her offer, giving us access to Brainjacker, and use her mechanized arm to our advantage. Elise, like Tyrus, is a rather optimistic person. She's willing to make sacrifices to benefit humanity, but expects everyone else to pull their weight to make the world a better place. She's definitely one of the wiser Blade Masters we met. Proceeding to make our way through Istanbul, we reach the isolation ward of Dahl's daughter and Brain Jack her to find out where his location is. It's in Transylvania. Dahl, a Hake who once worked to heal diseases, now spreads them and is the cause of the Great Plague, causing suffering all over Europe. He believes that technology and science are selfishly used for race and religion. Technology is both the issue and solution to him, which is why he follows Geist. If we put an end to him, the root of the Great Plague will be eliminated. So we take care of him with whatever we can. He represents Khan on the Bagua, symbolizing career and ears, two things which tie back into what we know about him. He worked as a man of science looking to make the world a better place before falling into the hands of Geist and using his abilities to cause chaos. As for his ears, his designs show that his ears bear an obvious resemblance to that of a bat. Once we've taken care of Dahl, we were able to get rid of all the Hake in Europe. As we were instructed previously, after we dealt with all the Hake in Europe, we followed through on the promise to meet up in Lisbon with Blademaster Kitty. Before that, however, as we made our way through Europe, dealing with the Hake and gained the help of the Blade Masters, we also got to see how Kay and Machen further developed as characters, which warrants a good amount of attention. Starting with Kay once again, despite us not getting to play as her for long, Kay is still a very active character in the game's plot. As we go from Hong Kong all the way to Lisbon, we get to see her take in the many things that happen, react to them, and bounce them off of Machen. She still maintains her caring and nice attitude, but isn't afraid to criticize Machen if he gets out of line, such as when he promises to go to India and defeat Shaja. At first, all she cares about is being able to save her father, but after seeing the destruction Geist has caused in Europe, she wants to do more than just rely on others and put a stop to the chaos. After seeing the pessimism of Devon, she and Machen determine that they don't like making choices solely because of one's duty. In Leon, Kay learns from Tyrus that making personal sacrifices for the greater good of everyone else is sometimes a sad but necessary evil. Although she might not get the Blade Masters, she's willing to try and understand them. Which she eventually does realize after meeting Elise in Athens. Kay gets that the Blade Masters choose to sacrifice their lives not out of duty but for a passion, for wanting to protect others and the world they live in. Kay concludes that she wants to be one of these people who end up doing their part to make the world a better place, even if it means sacrifice. It fits back into that theme of sacrifice and choices that the Blade Masters had to make, as well as symbolizing Kay's development as the daughter of a Blade Master. As the main character, I really like Kay a lot. It's interesting to see how she has to come to terms with how people make sacrifices for the benefits of others. Typically in Atlas games using a similar dialogue system, the main character is often pretty much just a blank slate who doesn't say anything. So having one who comments and comes to a conclusion about their system of beliefs is really interesting to me. Also, for a much less substantial reason, I just really like Kay because she's a nice person. Also, she has one of the coolest Kazuma Kaneko designs, like, it's just so simple but sick. Also, it's rad. Moving on to our other main character, Makin slash Makina. As we've gone through more and more of the world and absorbed the more Sai, we've continued to see how Makin has evolved as an individual. By answering Kay's questions, the two begin to form some sort of a connection, and Makin starts to genuinely care for Kay's well-being. It's simple, but I like how we the player represent Makin. We go into the game not knowing what to expect and end up developing feelings and thoughts towards the characters and lore of this game. We want to see everyone get their good ending, and that's a pretty cool use of video games as an idea. The concept presented is by no means an original one, but it is done pretty effectively if you ask me. 
Another important thing of note regarding Machin is the relationship he has with Geist. Earlier in the video I had mentioned two things. Geist has powers similar to Machin, and that there's one very significant example of yin and yang I'd come back to, which that time is now. During the Moscow section, Blademaster Kitty informed us of Geist's abilities and motivations. He has powers similar to Machin and uses them to cause harm. But as we continued to play the game, we learned from the Hake that there was way more to it than just that, with Geist's true goal being to unite everyone under one sigh and create harmony. There are many points throughout where it's not too subtly implied that Machin and Geist are two sides of the same coin, Machin representing Yang and Geist being Yin. See, Machin and the Blade Masters to an extent represent Yang, as they want to maintain the way things are right now and do their best to protect the people on Earth to achieve harmony. However, they do have their negative sides, by disallowing the philosophies of people like Geist and the Hake to exist, symbolizing that darkness within the light. As for Geist and the Hake, they represent Yin. They use rather underhanded tactics to get what they want, killing and ruining the lives of many people. It's no doubt what they're doing is obviously not okay, but their intent to grant everyone on Earth harmony is not a bad thing. It's just what they do to get there is pretty fucked up though. Representing that light within the darkness. That being said, I think it's time that we actually enter the end game of Machin X. We make our way through the opposition in Lisbon, where we meet with Kitty and Ko. Throughout the game, Ko has been trying to reach Machin to get it to separate its Psy with K's, and very eagerly asks Machin to go to Brazil and have Dr. David Guinness separate K's Psy from Machin. Machin agrees, wanting to go see the doctor. K, however, showing her resolve from her time with the Hake, Blade Masters, and Machin in Europe, would rather put an end to Geist, putting herself before the world. This little exchange also shows how Machin, and to an extent the player, have developed a connection with K. However, Blademaster Kitty is angry at the thought, wanting us to take care of the Hake Yusuf in Saudi Arabia. Wanting to do all we can, we take Kitty up on the offer but promise to go see Dr. David Guinness in Brazil after Yusuf is taken care of. We head to Saudi Arabia to deal with Yusuf, making our way through his oil palace. Once we reach him, he begins to berate us, asking why we follow the Blade Masters. We learn that his ideals are pretty similar to that of Hake Rei, believing that humans are incapable of determining good and evil, and instead of trying to determine good, he's focused on absolute justice, which he likely intends to achieve through following Geist's plan to achieve harmony. All this leads him into representing Kun on Bagua, which symbolizes relationships and organs. Looking into the supplemental material reveals his relationship with his brother and father weren't the best to keep it brief. As for his organs, there is main mode of attacking Machin during the encounter. Moving on though, he sees no point in trying to reason with us and attacks. It's not much of a fight though, we've gained so much strength in Europe that we're easily able to put an end to Yusuf. With him taken care of, we're off to Brazil to meet with Dr. Guinness and Co. It's one hell of a way there, but we make it somehow. When we arrive, the doctor informs us that Kay's Sai has gotten very weak, and the only way to separate her Sai from Machin would be using an untested reverse brain jacking procedure. But since Kay's body is back in Japan, and all the air routes have been shut down due to the impending war, it won't be likely to have Kay's Sai separated from Machin in time. The doctor suggests letting Kay's Sai go comatose in order to delay her Sai from being absorbed, and with no other choices, we do that. After that, we have one more Hake to take care of in America. President Hake Brown. Despite the impending war between the US and China, Brown is still a follower of Geist, where he reveals that Geist actually brainjacked the current ruler of China. Brown chooses to follow Geist, not because he holds any ideals or agrees with what Geist believes, but because Geist took advantage of his sigh in a vulnerable state after losing support from the US citizens. This leaves Brown in an interesting spot. He's more so a puppet and less of a character in Machin X. I wouldn't be surprised if he had some sort of intersection with the philosophy of Geist. However, that information isn't there. I bring this up because I don't really have any idea of where to put him on the Bagua. Frankly, my best bet here is to go with Xian, which can mean father and head, aspects core to Brown's design. Head is pretty obvious, cause... Yeah, that. And father as in the sense he leads America, I guess? I'm really grasping here, I know, but I don't got much to work with, like I said. But anyways, taking care of Brown, our final destination leads us to China, where we begin our final crusade to deal with Geist. It takes a while and it's pretty tough, but we finally confront Geist. There we learn Geist's true motives and his reason for kidnapping Kay's father. Geist's plan is to control all the Psy in the world using his godly powers to free people of pain by protecting them and leading them to a harmonious world. Geist is definitely one of those villains who fits into the ends justifies the means type villains, and by extent, the same is true for all other Hake. We battle him in our toughest fight yet and ended up succeeding.
After that, we see a scene in which things seem to have gone back to normal. Chief Sagami is okay and was able to recover his Sai. The potential war between China and US was prevented, and we're finally able to separate Kei's Sai from Makin and get her back into her body. All seems well and everyone is able to resume a peaceful life, but not before seeing one last cutscene in which Kei follows up on the promise she made to Makin. Remember our promise to travel the world? Are you ready? Ending the Blade Master route of Machin X. Yes, one of many endings. Weren't you paying attention? I literally said earlier that there were multiple endings to this game. Anyways, I decided to get the biggest and most important ending out of the way first. If you have to ask me what I think about this ending, I personally think it's pretty rock solid. A happy yet still conclusive ending. It gives us the viewers a good understanding on how both Kay and Machin came to the conclusion of their own philosophies, and how they were rewarded by being given the best outcome for both of them. There are six other endings to go through, some are somewhat big and others are not so big. I will be going over all of them, though I won't be able to go from start to finish with the other stories. Just the key aspects that make them distinct. A lot of Machin X remains the same about until three-fourths of the way through the game, so please note that. However, what if we don't want to be the good guy this time around, going against everything we did and believed in previously? Well, we can, and it's more than possible. This time around, we go from helping the Blade Masters to offing them. Whichever Blade Master we come across, we get rid of them. We don't have to find and get rid of every Blade Master, but we do what we can. The thing I compare it most to is Undertale's No Mercy route. As for why I don't refer to it as a chaos ending like the many Shin Megami Tensei games, will be relevant soon enough. But anyways, we make our way through all of Europe, killing whatever Blade Masters we come across and get continuously scolded by Kay. As usual, we make our way to Lisbon, and once there, we reach Kitty who confronts us and asks us if we're with her or against her. Since the answers are pretty obvious, we end up having to fight her, not before she has his face Ko first, who is very easily taken care of. Now we're on to Kitty herself, who I'd like to get into now. I know I've mentioned Kitty a lot up until this point, but I felt it most appropriate to analyze her character now while it's most relevant. Kitty is the highest ranking and most powerful of all the playable Blade Masters in Machin X. She's very adamant on maintaining the world the way it is now, being the one who actually proposed the original Machin project to deal with Geist. She also holds the belief that humanity's path is not up to the gods. She's very proud of her role as a Blade Master and won't ever go down without a fight, willing to sacrifice even Ko to get what she wants. She very much represents that darkness within light, using a similar ends justifies the means tactic to get what she wants, like Geist and the Hake. She isn't afraid of cracking a few eggs to make an omelette. In spite of that, she still wants to do good things, just what she does is sometimes morally dubious. But anyways, after dealing with Kitty and Ko, Kei Sai ends up getting absorbed by Machin and leaving her body without a mind. With that, we head to Saudi Arabia and meet with Yusuf. He asks us one last question to see if we're on his side, which we are, and go to China to deal with Li Fu Shou. We make our way through the Blade Master's final opposition, gauntlet through gauntlet, and make it to the big boss of the Hake Rune and Blade Master... Master Li Fu Shou. He's been a seemingly rather unimportant character throughout the game, but he really starts to come more relevant as the final boss of the Hake route. Li Fu Shou is a very old but nonetheless powerful person. He sees desiring power as a natural thing humans do but holds the sentiment that seeking power but lacking knowledge leads to an abuse of power. He understands that Geist holds his own Tao to achieve harmony, but it's one that lacks knowledge once more. He's the wisest of the Blade Masters. He'd likely be willing to understand Geist if he had complete understanding of his Tao, but for now, sees him as a threat with too much power. Li Fu Shou then gives us a monologue, saying that Makin has become just another Geist, once again tying back into that theme of yin and yang seen throughout, by having Makin follow the ways of yin. After his little speech, Li Fu Shou proceeds to attack us and we enter the final battle of the Hake route. Li Fu Shou puts up one hell of a fight and when we defeat him, we see the ending. We see the two scientists in hiding, reading the newspaper. And it seems the war between China and the US ended up taking place. Geist tells us that the human race has been drastically reduced to a pleasurable amount and now all minds are under the control of his side. Geist has achieved his goal of attaining harmony. Geist the Hake and Makin have won. As for what I think about this ending, well, not really a fan of this one. 
a lot of the Atlas and Law and Neutral Chaos games are really good at showing both the good and bad, but it feels like in Machina X that one side is definitely favored over the other here. Not to say that alignments can't be good endings with positive uh, repercussions and stuff like that, it's just it has to be both ways honestly. I think it would have been best if we got to see K end up joining the Hake, concluding that their way is the only path that will lead humanity towards harmonization. By having K berate the player for their decisions, it really makes this feel like a bad ending and not so much a chaos ending. I really feel bad whenever I do it because I've come to like a lot of the Blade Masters and especially K. It's definitely the weakest ending of the game if you ask me, but it could have been great. It just needs some tweaking. In neutrality, we return to Hake Yusuf in Saudi Arabia like last time. But this time, we choose not to side with the Hake, having to once again take care of Yusuf. After that, we take care of Mr. President and go to Geist Castle, beating him. In the ending, we see Makin and Kei's body standing in a world of ruin. Then, what seems to be the ghost of Li Fu Shou appears. He proceeds to tell us that the choices that Makin made were confusing. He still defeated Geist as he was instructed, but he also chose not to save Kei when asked. Lifu Shou informs us that we're now the leader of this new world, bidding us a farewell and hoping we set the world back on the path of order. After that, we're left with nothing in a world of ruin. Despite my sentiments of the previous ending, I definitely think that this one in particular was better handled than the Hake route of the game. It has faults of its own, but still, an interesting ending. Getting the big negative out of the way first, I'm really not a fan of how this ending just implies it's another chaos route, which it isn't. I'm not sure whether to chalk that up the shoddy translation or if that was the intent or not, but it still leads to a sour taste in my mouth. As for the good, I think unlike the Hake route, having K not come to terms with any sort of conclusion was the best choice of action here. It in a way makes sense to have K be inconclusive if Machin can't seem to make up its mind. Neutral endings in Atlas games can sometimes feel unsatisfying by design, which I think was the intent Machin was going for in its neutral route. It leaves you in a world of nothingness, Nothing gained and nothing really earned for anyone. Neither the Hake, nor the Blade Masters. Everyone's screwed here. In this ending, we agree to take up Ko's request to see Dr. Guinness and Kitty's request to stop Yusuf in Arabia, who's dealt with easily. Next in Brazil, we once again have to put Kay's side into a comatose state. After we take care of Brown in America, and we're off to Guy City. We make it through, and when we reach him, Geist, seeing as we didn't take care of all of his hake, attempts to reason with us, unlike in the Blade Master route, giving us two options, either save the chief and fight Geist, or save Kay and call it a truce. Taking the latter of this ultimatum, Geist gives Makin the chief's knowledge on how to perform the reverse brain jack. The cost is that we have to call a truce with Geist and don't end up saving Mr. Sagami like Kay desired. Another edge to this sword is that it's also implied that Geist ends up getting his way asking to make Kay's life good while Makin can. We return to the lab with Chief Sagami's knowledge. The reverse brain jack is a success, and just about everyone is happy, except for Kay. She looks at you, disappointed that you chose to save her over her father in defeating Geist. And the game ends. This is my this is, this is my favorite bad ending in Machin X, and probably in any game ever. It shows that the game was capable of doing a straight up bad ending alongside the typical law and chaos alignments. In this ending, everything just goes wrong. You end up not being able to complete the mission to defeat Geist, potentially letting him succeed, and breaking the connection you had with Kay by not saving her father. Over the course of the route, like some of the others, we end up getting to form a connection with Kay, but we weren't able to put an end to all of the Hake in Europe and end up trying to fight Geist anyways. Despite wanting to do what's best, Geist still sees the potential to reason with you, and does so by using Machin's feelings towards Kay. By fighting Geist, we'd end up killing Kay because of her weakened sigh, and by calling a ceasefire, we can save Kay at the cost of Mr. Sagami and letting Geist live. We aren't able to save both, so by calling a truce, I think I'm doing something good for a character slash person I like by saving them. But I'm also going against their desire to save their father, the world, and defeat Geist. That one line that Kay has at the ending, telling us that a machine really can't have feeling hits hard. Because we likely did this for her in the end, it's not what she wanted. It makes me feel bad, but it's in a smart, cool way, which I really like a lot, unlike the Hake ending. As for the other option we're given, if we choose to refuse Geist's offer, we end up having to fight him like usual. We're once again able to defeat him, and after his defeat, we witness Kay's side being absorbed into Makin, killing her. Next, we cut to a scene back in the Kanazawa Research Institute. The war has been averted, Geist has been thwarted, and both the Chief and Kei's size have returned to their body. Everything seems happy. 
but Chief Sugami catches on quick. He asks if his daughter has died, which we're given a shot of Kei's eyes, now glowing, revealing to Chief Sugami that Kei no longer exists, and it's only Makin within Kei's body. Despite how much of a downer ending this might be, and it is a pretty downer ending, I still like it. It's more bitter than sweet. I would say it almost leads on the bad ending spectrum, but because Kei and Makin were able to save the world by stopping Geist and saving her father, we were able to fulfill her request. She got what she wanted at the cost of losing her life in the progress. In the end, however, that understanding of making sacrifices she learned ended up being fulfilled and she became a Blade Master. Though the ending presents itself in a more negative light, upon looking further into it, I believe it has some rather positive qualities to it. Not many, but more so than might be visible on an initial viewing. Similar to the previous two endings, in this route, we just go through Europe, dealing with whatever hockey we come across, but not going out of our way to stop them either. We end up getting to Lisbon like always, this time turning down Ko's offer to see the doctor, and instead agreeing to Kitty's request to take care of Yusuf. Which we do. Next, we once again deal with Hake Brown in the White House. After which, we're given a scene showing that KSI has absorbed into Makin, once again killing her off. We head over to Geist Domain, dealing with any opposition in the way, when about halfway through, Ko confronts us. He's upset, very upset that we chose not to save Kay and attempts to kill us, but we swiftly kill him. After that, we go through the rest of the level on our way to Geist. We end up reaching him where he scolds us for killing the girl and not understanding our actions. He views you this time around as much less of a threat, but we fight him once more and end up winning. After that, we get a scene back in the Kanazawa research lab, where the two scientists are watching the news, reports showing that the war between China and the US was avoided. Both countries now working together with the UN to construct Europe. We then transition to a scene at the White House, where we see Hake Brown alive in his office. His staff are concerned about China, worried they may break their promise, but he tells them that the devil leading China is gone, assuring that the promise won't be broken. Brown then wishes for some time alone. His subordinates then leave the room, and we see in Brown's hand, Makin, still in control of Hake Brown's body. In the end, Makin did all it was ordered to. He took care of Geist, nothing more and nothing less. This ending is weird, but that's really what I like about it. Earlier, Geist scolded us about not coming to any sort of conclusion, just doing what we were ordered to, it seems. As for Kay, she would have gotten what she wanted to to some extent, but didn't truly realize why yet. Neither you or Kay came to any sort of conclusion and just got done what needed to be done. The ending makes me feel like I'm missing something, and it works for that reason. My first time around playing Machin X in April, I want to say, this was the first ending I got in the game, and I felt so unfulfilled by this ending. I wasn't really invested or engaged much at all in Machin at this time around, and was just hoping to finish it, and I think those are the kinds of people who are going to get this ending most of all. For most people, they just put the game down and go about their day, but I wanted to get a better ending, I wanted to see more, and ended up with all the endings in my hands. And now I'm here scripting this 17 page video and recording audio at 1.30 in the morning. This ending called me out for choosing not to engage with it to a certain extent by giving me an unsatisfying ending. The biggest shortcoming of this ending though is although it works as a big stinger ending for the first timers, it won't leave much of an impact if you've gotten some of the other endings beforehand since you chose to engage with Machin to a much greater extent. In spite of that however, I still think the ending does a pretty good job of blue balling you Okay, but funnily enough though, this actually isn't the route speedrunners use for the game. That would actually be the next one. Getting into the more sweet side of the bittersweet endings, as well as the last ending for this game, is the sacrifice. For this ending, you spend less time in Europe and get to Lisbon rather quickly, like the previous few. Once there, we agree to see Dr. Guinness and rejects Kitty's offer to take down Yusuf, much to Kay and Kitty's dismay. We make our way through Brazil and to the doctor's office there. Turns out, since we made it to Brazil rather swiftly, none of the air rats have been shut down and we're able to have Kay's body sent over and attempt to perform the reverse brain jack procedure. However, one of the people on the plane delivering Kay's body ends up being one of Geist's followers and ends up delivering it to him. Geist sends a transmission to Ko and Dr. Guinness, letting the two know that he has Kay's captive and uses her as ransom. Ko, wanting to make things right, offers himself up to Machin to use, take on Geist, and save Kay. Machin brainjacks Ko, who now rocks some pretty sick body armor and we're off to Geist. Before getting into the ending, I think it's time I stop blue-balling Ko and get into his character. 
He's a longtime friend of Kay and has had a great deal of adoration for her. He doesn't have too many friends, let alone female friends. And although a pretty wimpy seeming dude, we've seen more than once he's willing to put himself on the line, and two of the seven endings more than willing to fight Machin and not standing a chance in the slightest, but still putting in the effort to follow through for what he believes in. In this ending, he ends up giving himself to Machin as a way of saving Kay and defeating Geist, inhabiting the theme of sacrifice in Machin X. Anyways, we head to Geist City and tear through his defense like it's nothing. We reach Geist only for Ko to be fatally wounded from a cheap shot by Geist. In a last ditch effort, however, Ko throws Machin at the captive K. Thank you. Please defeat him and end this fight. Now, it's up to Kay to put an end to Geist, and it seems as if her journey throughout the world has made her stronger because she's able to tear into Geist easy. He's once again defeated, however, Machin has died, sacrificing itself to save Kay and stop Geist. I like this ending a lot. It shows the extent of which Machin has come to cherish those he loves, sacrificing himself for everyone. You see how Machina went from just an artificial brain to a genuine person, who was able to both achieve its goal, satisfy Kay's wishes, and stop Geist. Though it's not an ending without issues, considering the rapid pace it typically takes to get this ending, Machin's reasoning for wanting to save Kay can feel really underdeveloped and sort of artificial, and the same applies to Kay's whole feeling the need to sacrifice herself to save the world. This is an issue I have with a good majority of the other endings, but it definitely can feel most apparent here given the seemingly out of character decision of Machin made in the end. This in spite of that, I still like it because it still encapsulates those themes of sacrifice rather well and ends up doing a pretty good job of making me feel, with some surprisingly pretty good voice acting. With that out of the way, we've covered every and all endings Machin X has to offer, so what's the overall verdict for this game's writing? Well, Machin X has a pretty interesting story, although nothing about it is even close to perfect, like how it does alignments, some of its characters, and sometimes confusing inconsistencies between endings. However, what I think Machin wants to do with its story, it does rather well for the most part. There's an interesting world dilemma and development of characters, as well as use of themes and real world influences to make Machin's scenario rather memorable and something I know I won't be forgetting anytime soon. Sure, some endings might hit the mark better than others, but when Machin wants to hit the mark, it hits it pretty hard. With that, I'd like to end off the video here, however, there's still one more aspect to this game I want to cover before closing the lid. How this game presents its story. Being a 90s game, a very late 90s game, Machin X's presentation isn't exactly perfect to say the least, in more than one aspect. Starting off with the game's voice acting, which is a pretty miss and barely hit. It's often bad, but it's capable of being phenomenal. A decent chunk of the voice actors are pretty good at delivering their lines, with there being some pretty notable talent like John St. John, the voice of Duke Nukem, Lonnie Manella, voice of Lucas and Smash, and Ivy and Soul Calibur, and Ryan Drum, the original Sonic the Hedgehog. A good majority of Machin has some pretty good talent, but some are definitely better than others, and it shows. However, for the time it was released, Machin has pretty decent voice acting. The thing really holding it back, however, is the audio mix. It's really inconsistent, with characters often sounding like they're recording in completely different rooms. If it weren't for a rather shoddy mix, I'd be willing to call Machin X a rather passable performance, but as it is right now, it needs some work. Moving away from the audio part of Machin X, at least for the time being, how about the graphics? It's fine. It honestly looks alright for a Dreamcast game, but 
As it's trying to replicate the art of Kazuma Kanako in a 3D environment for the first time, it's very telling. The characters look like their art for the most part and tend to animate rather well with a lot of unique moving parts. However, when in cutscenes, they don't look all too graceful, mainly due to the distracting omission of mouths. Except for K of all characters, it's weird, but it doesn't take me out of the experience that much. It's just... It's like it's something that's always in the back of my brain while I'm watching these cutscenes, but I'm still able to focus and pay attention to the story. As for the environments, they're all very distinct and have a variety of moods, ranging from the sterile and clean Kanazawa lab to the decrepit and unsettling Istanbul. No one level looks alike, and it's really cool. Very impressively though, Machinax runs at 60 FPS on the original Dreamcast hardware, and was a huge selling point on the back of the box, and it looks great. Despite my issue with the way a lot of the humans look and animate sometimes, if the purpose of cutting down on polys was for the sake of the frame rate, I'm willing to forgive it because the game feels like butter, which is important for a hack and slash game like Machina where you're doing a lot of moving around. Although its visuals aren't perfect, not even great perhaps, it has a distinct visual style unlike anything I've seen on the Dreamcast, and it's all thanks to the aforementioned skills of artist Kazuma Kaneko, creating the designs the game uses, and if you had to ask me, I'd say Machina is definitely one of his more unique projects. There's a great emphasis on humanoid creatures and body horror to some extent, seeing as that's one of the game's grander themes as we once discussed. The full pieces he did for this game are honestly some of my favorites, and I would get a poster of this. I love this drawing. I love pretty much all of these drawings. It's great. I love it. Returning to the audio of Machinex is with the game's soundtrack done by the ever-popular Shoji Meguro, very well known for his work on Persona 3 through 5. I'm a huge fan of his work, it's awesome, especially in Machin X. The game uses a lot of techno, electronic, and ambient composition and fits the game's mechanical feel very well. It's one of Meguro's most unique and kick-ass OSTs. It's techno as hell and I love it. Working alongside Meguro is the underappreciated Takahiro Ogata, known for working on projects such as Digital Devil Saga 2 and the very underlooked SMT9 OST. Ogata contributed a great deal to Machin's OST, creating a lot more of the low-key and ambient tracks in the game. Though he did create a handful of pretty energized tracks for Machin, which work well. His compositions for Machin are pretty rock solid. To summarize what I think about Machin X's presentation, it's definitely a game from the 90s, a lot of techno music and stuff mixed with some dated, albeit charming visuals. And some crummy voice acting, you know, just gotta sprinkle that in there. A lot of Machin feels rough by today's standards, from its writing to its presentation. As for the gameplay though, well I'm literally 17 pages into this script and I think I'm gonna save that along with a few other things for next time. As for now, I'd like to thank all of you for watching this far. Machin's pretty cool, and I hope with this retrospective to give this game that's rather weird the attention it so deserves. I'd also love to give huge shoutouts to my boy Chanel and AU for being huge helps with this video. This video likely wouldn't have been possible without them. Also, Huge shout out to the artist Flesh Instinct on Instagram and Twitter for creating an absolute phenomenal piece of art for this retrospective. He is like literally one of my favorite artists online and you should definitely consider commissioning him and you will follow him, okay? Anyways, stay tuned for more Machin and don't forget to drink some water.